the Tenric, a very unusual creature. Hello friends, I'm Eric Brittingham, otherwise known as Mr. B from Wildlife on the Move, and welcome to Let's Go Wild. Our creature feature for today is unusual creatures, and boy do we have an unusual one right here in front of you. Before he gets away, let me grab him and I'll show him to you here in the camera. Hold on, little buddy. Yeah, this is Ozzy, and Ozzy, oh, no, he's not a porcupine. Nope, he's not a hedgehog. He's actually a tenric. So we're gonna talk about tenrics and the differences between hedgehogs, porcupines, and tenrics today because this is an unusual creature and he comes all the way from Madagascar, the small island on the east coast of Africa. That's only where this is found. So let's talk about him. He is not related to the hedgehog and that the reason why is, yes, he has the spines, but this little guy does not roll up into balls like hedgehogs do to protect themselves. The hedgehogs actually roll up into a ball and they'll hiss and click and poke into things uh, to get those spines to help them out. And the spines of a hedgehog, just like a tenric, do not come out. They actually are on the body so that they can be protected by that. When the hedgehog rolls up into a ball, they do that in order to uh, protect their soft fleshy parts. Whereas this animal, he does have the spines, he'll raise them up like a spiked haircut and he'll raise up on his hind legs. And you notice these sharp claws on his feet. He actually show those front claws and he'll open his mouth and he'll go ah, like that. So that's what this guy does. He has more of a defense mechanism to put up a, a real front uh, to scare off his predators and enemies. So that's what this guy does compared to a hedgehog. Now, why is he not a porcupine? Well, he doesn't have quills on his backside. Porcupines have quills just on their backside and more fluffy hair on the top. And we have two types of porcupines. We have a North American porcupine and an African crested porcupine. So they come from different places, but they're very similar in the fact that they have the quills on the backside. The porcupine actually has to run backwards and go boop. No, they don't make the boop noise. That's just me. But they actually poke animals with those quills or they'll brush the animal with those quills and they go inside the animal's skin. And as the animal moves, it actually causes uh, the, the quill to go deeper and deeper because they have little barbs on the quill. And and so it can cause infection and cause that animal to die. And that's how the porcupine uses it to defend themselves. The other differences are the fact that hedgehogs, they, they eat a lot of the same things as the tenric. They are, are classified way long ago as insectivores, but we found out now they're more omnivores. They do eat fruit and plants. And this little guy does eat fruits and plants as well, but insects are definitely on the diet. They love to eat insects. Whereas the porcupine is an herbivore, they just eat plants, mostly the bark of trees and leaves. And so that's some of the difference as well. What we found is that this little animal is more commonly related to an otter shrew. So I'm going to let you do some research this time. Go wild and do some research for me and find out more about the otter shrew. But you've noticed he's got these really long whiskers. You can see those. And those are very, very important to him because he doesn't have super good eyesight. He is nocturnal. He comes out at night. So he relies on those whiskers to find and feel his way around uh, where he's trying to find all those insects and also fruits and plants. You notice those eyes were a little small. So he doesn't need a lot of light since he relies mostly on his whiskers, but also you'll notice him wiggling that nose back and forth. He smells really well with his nose. He can actually smell insects buried six to eight inches underground. They have very good hearing as well with those two ears, and we've talked about those claws. The other thing that makes this guy a little different than hedgehogs is those claws allow him to climb trees. You saw him earlier. I'm going to put him right here, see if he'll hold on for you, because he has claws that allow him to hold on to tree branches, whereas hedgehogs can not do that. They're actually not able to do that. His back feet, you can't see it right now on screen, but his back feet are actually pivoting backwards. So he's able to hold on and grip even upside down. So that's a pretty amazing thing that makes this guy a little different than a hedgehog. They got little pig-like teeth. They actually crunch up the insects and it allows them to, to eat their food that way. 
So a very unusual creature, but a fascinating one at that and found only in Madagascar. So this is actually one of our animal ambassadors that has been given to us as a rehomed animal. Doesn't make the greatest pet. You actually have to have permits for these guys. Now hedgehogs can be pets, but remember they are nocturnal. If you're a light sleeper, you're gonna hear them banging around in their cage at night, it might keep you up. So not always the best pet for everybody, but this animal is amazing and important to our world. And uh, we hope that you'll go wild and help this animal as well. So coming up, we appreciate you joining us for our creature feature. We're going to take a short break so some of our wild supporters can share a message with you. And then you don't want to miss it. Stick around. We're going to have our wild side chat with Tim Bryce and some really magnificent, unusual creatures from the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. We'll see you then. Let's Go Wild is brought to you by On Air Media, Happy Hawk Property Group, Mr. Longarm. Welcome back to Let's Go Wild, and now it's time for our Wild Side Chat. And I'm so excited to have a great friend and an awesome person with me today. This is Tim Bryce from the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. So welcome, Tim. We're glad to have you here, and can't wait to have you tell us all about these items you brought since you're involved with collections and the education department there at the Perot. But before we do that, just tell us a little bit about the Perot Museum, their mission, and what they do to serve the public. Yeah, thank you for having me, Eric. Absolutely. Um, so the Perot Museum, our, our mission is to inspire people through nature and science. Very inspire good. Inspire minds through nature and science. And we have all kinds of programs in place to do that. Um, Absolutely. We have uh, summer camps coming up pretty soon. Cool. And uh, we, we're working on digital content called the Why Nots program. I, I saw that and it's spelled an interesting way. It is. And, <laughs> and it's basically, it's, it's students reaching out to other students. It's Teeks Align. It's in English and Spanish. Awesome. So um, we can help those students who have been working remotely to hopefully connect with some of the things. Maybe so kind of a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship yeah. as well as education, but some really cool content that they can learn from. Yeah, and involving a lot of STEM uh, science opportunities. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, let's dive into some of the things you brought because I am always fascinated with different specimens, of course, live things for sure, since we are wildlife on the move and we mostly do live animal shows. But it's always cool to go to the Pro Museum and see all the different exhibits and uh, collection items. And I know you're very involved with that. So so what do you want to start with? What do you want to tell us about? Well, um, I guess uh, let's start with maybe, do you want to start with the porcupine? Maybe? Yeah, we can talk about the porcupine. So this is a North American porcupine, this is right? A North American porcupine. I don't know if we can turn it around yeah, there. I'm going to try a lot to of people think that porcupines are only covered with quills. You can see on the tail here, you can see quills sticking out. Right. But they also have a lot of guard hairs, which are these outer hairs here, and thick under fur. Awesome. which helps keep them warm. They often live in cold climates as well as even down here in Texas. Very cool. And uh, that helps kind of keep them warm, keep them protected. Also keeps their quill sharp, not being exposed and rubbed against things all the time. Very awesome. Yeah, a lot of people have the misconception that porcupines shoot these quills, but they actually have to run backwards and that's poke true. the animal with or it. Or whack the animal with their tail. Absolutely. And that's usually when they get you is something comes up too close and whacks them. One of their few predators are fishers, which actually get them rolled over upside ah, down. Ah, so they get the soft, so fleshy they, parts yeah, of the belly. Yeah, because there's no quills on the belly. Right. And we also have an African crested porcupine in the world, a little bit bigger than this. Um, has a lot more quills on the backside that kind of frill it out almost like a fan. But this one, yeah, when these quills come out, they actually can dig into an animal, right? They have little that's barbs on them. They're barbed. And so as that goes deeper and deeper in, can cause infection, and that's how animals can die from a porcupine. So very fascinating animal a very unusual creature yeah, for and, sure and if you get the quills in you supposedly if you clip the quill off and flatten it out uh, it's supposed to pull out a little bit easier okay that, that's a good tip I hadn't but heard about dogs before. are often the ones that are on the tail end of the porcupine, of the porcupine absolutely all right cool that's an awesome animal and amount uh, definitely this would be more of like a taxidermy type mount correct because I know is, you have different ways of doing things yes true that's that's taxidermy um, Somebody has prepared the animal, put a form, uh, usually made out of foam inside of it, and glass eyes. 
right. uh, and tried to pose it in the shape it would have looked like in life. naturally. Yeah, and I think the other Here's thing is another... yeah, you got one up here too. So I, I think what's fascinating too that people don't know, and I know you're really into insects as well. That's one of your passions. But uh, one of the things that I love telling people about is a lot of times you all you will use insects to help you know eat the flesh and clean we the do. bones and things like that. We what do. do you do so, for that? So like an alligator skull, there's different ways you can clean skeletal material and domestic beetles are Dermestid one of those beetles, things. Right. And those um, are like mealworms, right? Uh, they, similar, mealworms yeah. Okay. It's usually the larva of the domestic beetle does most of the chewing of the, work? Okay. Of the dried flesh. And that's one of the reasons we don't find things laying dead out in nature for very long is right. between scavengers and then a cleanup crew like domestic beetles. That's what takes um, care of nature's recyclers are exactly. at work. But then we can That's utilize them to help us learn yeah. from these animals and their skulls and their their skeletal remains. That's pretty yeah. cool. So what else were you going to show there? I'm oh, sorry just, I interrupted just you. insects, since you mentioned insects. Yeah. You know, some of the different preservations, we dry insects sometimes. Okay. Sometimes you'll pin them if they're not inside a Riker mount like this. Um, for these, we wanted the kids to be able to pass them around and handle them. Absolutely. So it's a little safer for the insects. But well, so, and I know you have a passion for the insects, as I said, and animals in general. You and I worked together at the Dallas Zoo a long time ago, and now you're at the Perot. So, you know, tell us a little bit in our audience about what sparked your interest in wildlife, animals, insect, uh, doing preserved specimens, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, how did, what, what's been your journey, you know, to work I, with wildlife? I think uh, probably started, I lived out in the country with my grandparents for a while, okay. and all of my family and extended family would bring in things they had found in nature. Ah, and, so it was uh, like a scavenger hunt from the yeah. family, and you had to figure out what it was? And... Live insects, dead insects, uh, they would help teach me how to preserve them. Uh, I had a great uncle who, before he went blind, worked at the Carnegie Museum. Oh, cool. And a lot of the things he learned there were passed down to my father. Nice. And, and then uh, likewise so, to you? Yeah. So we still have some of the skulls that he had uh, prepared and some plaster tracks from animals. Very cool. And um, I think that just kind of stuck with me. And then um, I had the chance to have some really good teachers in school that kind of fostered that along as well. That's always a, a key component of it as well. And then it, it sounds like you did a lot of exploring and uh, investigating of your own and probably attending a lot of different zoos and museums and things like that. Yeah, and, and having family and, and teachers to, to kind of keep that spark alive. Interested. That's cool. Um, that's definitely made the difference. Well, I know you got another interesting set of items right here that I want to have you talk about um, just because I love fossilized things, but then also there's a, a more modern replica or not even replica, but a modern uh, example of an animal that we're looking at in this section. Yeah, these are also animals that lived in Texas at one point in time. This is a piece of a leg bone from a mammoth. Oh, nice. And a piece of a tooth. And you can see, uh, if you look at the enamel here, the, the shape, the pattern of it here, it's very similar to modern-day elephant Oh, teeth. so in the front's the modern-day elephant yeah. tooth. This is a modern-day elephant molar. And basically, as they, as they go throughout their life, their molars push forward and fall out. Oh, wow. Um, so they have a set number of molars, and once they're done, that's it. That's really cool. But you can find these things here in Texas uh, if you're... Somebody out and about who likes looking. to go out and explore, just be careful. And then contact the Perot Museum and see yep. if it's an actual uh, fossilized, uh, you know, find, and then maybe become famous somehow. We have somehow. some yeah. uh, <laughs> some very uh, great preparators that work in the lab. Which, if you visit the museum, you can actually see them preparing bones that they've collected yeah, out I've, in the field. I've been there in that area. It's fascinating to watch them work. It's tedious work. It takes a lot of time to get yes. something to this level. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about that. So uh, Pro Museums open to the public. Uh, talk about the hours, some of the highlights and features of the Pro that you think people should check okay. out, and some of the unique opportunities there. Well, after this weekend, we will be going back to seven days a week. Uh, still limited capacity for now, so it helps if you pre-purchase your tickets in awesome. advance, uh, and there'll be timed entry. But um, we have everything from gigantic dinosaurs. Yes. You can race a T-Rex. That's see. one thing I was hoping you were going to mention. Yeah. I've never won. Have no. you ever won? No, Man, it's I'm legs not are that too fast. long. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you can actually race a T-Rex and several other, yep. uh, like an Olympic athlete and race car. and A cheetah, like that. a, cheetah a mosasaur even, yeah. that swims. Cool. Um, you can also go up and experience an earthquake on the earthquake machine. Nice. See the gems and minerals, which are beautiful. Yeah. And they're always switching out to new. Um, yeah, I think they have minerals. a. Don't you all have a, a grape jelly geode? Something. We like have that. a grape jelly geode. Yeah, we really also awesome. have a really nice gold display right now. Oh, cool. 
Um, and I know there's another exhibit. I'm not sure how long it will be, but uh, it's the Guinness Book. Yes, the Science of Guinness World Records. Uh, very cool. And that's our traveling exhibit. It's only here part of this year. Okay. And so you should come and see it before it's before gone. Before it's gone. Don't miss and, out uh, on that. Challenge your friends. See if you can break any of the records that are there um, on the displays. That's um, awesome. You can do anything from playing Pac-Man and basketball to um, practicing balance and hanging skills yeah. and punching uh, speed speed and puzzle tests. Very, very cool stuff. Well, another passion of yours. Tell us about this recent project, the Pro, and you are involved in here in the city of Dallas uh, involving birds especially. So uh, we've been helping with a project. Um, ben Jones, who was formerly at the zoo with Absolutely. us, um, yep. has, is now in charge of the Texas Conservation Alliance. Oh, very cool. Executive director. And he has set up this um I guess group of organizations locally that are participating in going and searching for birds that have struck buildings downtown oh, no. Unfortunate during situation. migration. Yeah. And it is. And um, the good thing about it is we're able to help birds that have been stunned or injured, get them some care, get Very them good. moved away from buildings. And also the, the specimens that have not made it uh, will be going to A&M. Okay. And they actually have about seven or eight researchers right now that are uh, – getting ready to study Hold that them. up one more time because okay. I think people might be familiar with this. We had an episode recently, and that is an American kestrel, American kestrel. one of our uh, native falcons. But, yeah, they, they run into things as well, and so it's a specimen we can learn from. What else you have? This is a, an American woodcock, which is the same as the taxidermy as one here. Yep, but this is to us. show you an example of what a study skin looks like. It's, it's kept very simple, stuffed with cotton and preservatives to keep the dermestid beetles from which bothering it down the road. Things. Yeah, absolutely. So it protects it. They don't get any special glass eyes because they're used to be kept in drawers right. for research. And I had a lot of these in college for my labs that I had to learn from and, and figure out what they were. And sometimes it was tough just because they don't look the same as they do when they're wild. And we've been finding all kinds of birds uh, downtown. So, wow. Um, so how can people get involved with you all to help out in that project? And what should we be doing to try to prevent this from happening? Well, we're just about to finish the spring season, search season. Uh, we okay. only have a couple days left, but we'll be hopefully doing this again in the fall. Okay. Uh, we did it last fall. And uh, you can actually volunteer, whether you live locally or somewhere else around the state. Awesome. Um, you can get involved with any local group that's got permits to go out and collect the birds, and then they'll send them to an institution like A&M or a museum to awesome. study. Very cool. uh, but also the biggest thing you can do is to turn out your lights. That's what I was hoping you would get to. So during these migratory times, uh, if we turn out lights, especially these big, tall buildings, that could really help and reduce the number of animals that are impacted. And a lot of people don't realize that a majority of these species are migrating at night. So they see right. these brightly lit areas. It confuses them. They come down. Once they're here, whether they've hit glass or not, uh -huh. they're in an area that's unfamiliar, and then they run into reflections off of oh, glass no. later yeah. on. So, so it can cause more problems down the road. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, and we'll have more information how you can contact the Pro Museum and, and even that project uh, down the road here of our show. But before we get to that, I, I've got a question that I always like to ask my guests. So if you could be any animal, Tim, what animal would it be and why? Well, I think um, <laughs> probably my favorite Texas animal would be the ringtail cat. Okay, I'm which, glad that you brought that because people don't get to see those too yeah, often. And no, a lot that's of people, an awesome animal to be. Yeah, a lot of people don't even realize they exist. Um, they're pretty secretive and nocturnal. Um, you're more likely to see them out in like Big Bend up in canyon areas. Absolutely, um, yeah. But we do have them here. Yeah. There's been footage of uh, them being seen here in Dallas in parking garages. Very cool. Um, there was a man at a mechanic shop last year that uh, caught one in a box trap and ah. later released it but he had no idea what he what he ran he into captured. yeah because very much like a raccoon tail and right and they're then, related and they are related yeah, yeah definitely to raccoons but kind of looks kinka jewish to me in the body yeah. um and, and that's kind if of you don't know what that is i want you to relatives. research that but yeah close relative to the raccoon and the kinka jew right so that's awesome. So is there any reason why you uh, are passionate about um, that or you think that that well, represents you? I, I always <laughs> enjoy unusual things, the things that um, people don't get to see and experience all Absolutely. the time. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love going out and exploring. Because you, you never know you what never you're going to find, right? Exactly. Yeah. And anyone can find something. That's cool. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question. You know, you've had a long journey and a very, very 
positive journey working with wildlife, whether it be the zoo or the museum or doing these uh, studies that, and collections that you're doing. Um, so what advice would you have to youngsters out there or anyone for that matter that would like to pursue a career such as yours? What would you tell them? I'd say, um, you know, just talk to your parents and get them to take you outside and explore. Awesome. Um, just do everything you can to go out and look you can't find something if you don't look. That's so, exactly right. Um, getting out, spending time in the field, but also getting involved in groups like Boy Scouts. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. You know, the museum has a, a teen group that um, basically is going to be um, doing different projects. TCA has uh, projects like pollinator gardens oh, very and nice. um, tree planting. That's so you're good, saying get involved, yeah, volunteer. volunteer when you can. It's not always getting paid for something, That's but true. those volunteer opportunities can definitely lead to a career down the road and, and experience. experience. Yeah, yeah, that's where I thought we would be going. It always looks good on a resume. It de definitely so. does, but it does help you get that experience. Well, you know, I could talk to you all day, and we could look at all of these items one by one because I'm always fascinated with it, but I certainly appreciate you joining us here for our sure. wild side Thanks, chat. Ken. Yeah, absolutely. So before we go, um, just tell our audience and our viewers then what they can do to help support the Perot Museum of Nature and Science or even what they can do to get out there and uh, and visit. Well, um, the PerotMuseum.org and uh, Facebook and Instagram are all great places to look up uh, what's going on. We also have a Twitter account. Um, you can see some of the different field projects that are going on. Oh, very cool. Our hours right now are... Um, 10 to 5 okay. on Sunday, 11 to 5. And then for members, it's 9 to 10 and 10 to 11. And so that was one area I wanted to talk about is, you know, become a member. That's a way that you would, you know, donate to the museum and help them support all the work that they're doing. So that's how you can be a wild child and make a difference for the Perot Museum of Nature and Science and our world. So again, yeah. Tim, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. Thank you and we'll have me. more information about the Perot Museum coming up later in the show. And we'll see you then. Thanks for joining us today, and from all of us at Wildlife on the Move, let's go wild again sometime. If you go to bonfire.com slash store slash wild dash where, we'll have information for how you can do that and support our animal care fund. But in the meantime, be a wild child and support our animal ambassadors like Ozzy here and my special guest and make a difference in the world. We'll see you soon. You can be a wild child and become a member at the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. Visit their website at perotmuseum.org and follow them on Facebook at Perot Museum. Donate to our animal care fund at mygivingcircle.org slash charity slash wildlife on the move. Check out our website and book our programming at www.wildlifeonthemove.com. Follow us on Facebook at Live Animal Shows. Follow us on Twitter at Mr. B underscore WOTM. Follow us on Instagram at Eric.WildlifeOnTheMove. And check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to this very program at Let's Go Wild. Subscribe to Patreon for monthly animal adventure videos at patreon.com slash animal adventures.